We pick back up at 8.22 in the fourth tape. We're with Chico's chaperones, as it were, who shove him at 8.28 to the floor. We're back at the old prison. It sounds late at night. At 8.36, we hear Paz call out Chico's name. Chico? Now, to me, it sounds as though this is the very first time, on tape anyway, that Paz doesn't sound either very drugged or dazed following a torture session. She sounds remarkably coherent, and she isn't humming love deterrence in that weak and dreamy sort of way. Chico? Paz? Chico? But also for the first time, it is Chico, not Paz, who won't or can't talk. It's like he's ignoring her, prompting her to repeat his name. There are twin pregnant pauses between both echoes of his name. Then at 8.44, Chico stops giving her the cold shoulder, but his words are passive aggressive, almost like a form of revenge against her for shutting him out. I thought you didn't want to talk to me. Notice that by saying this, Chico has started to emulate Skullface. The statement conveys an idea that there are rules and that Paz gets what she deserves for breaking them. It also implies Chico doesn't grasp why Paz had good reason to suspect that he was being used as part of some nefarious scheme against her. After another pause, Paz hauntingly echoes as a form of foreshadowing her later line in Ground Zeroes during gameplay and in the final cutscene, there's Paz. There's... It's all right, we got it out. There's one thing I want to say. Then she'll be talking about the bombs, destruction, but here she's talking about her feelings and, as we'll see, a form of creation. She completes the sentence, there's one there's thing I want to say. One thing I want to say. This echoes her earlier addiction, I do not think I want to talk to you. Tape 2, 208. You can clearly tell that something has changed about Paz. Now she's concerned about someone other than herself, or at least she's willing to admit that. She's been forced to let in her true feelings for Chico, which are protectiveness and gratefulness. More dramatic silence. The music builds, then a revelation. For the first time we know of, Paz speaks her truth, a truth that she so far kept concealed, maybe even out of necessity, from herself. I missed you, Chico. Now, for the first time, we hear so-called non-diegetic music, meaning music that isn't occurring in the story's actual world. What? I missed you, Chico. <sighs> Chico's so overcome with emotion, for a moment all he can do is shudder. We hear his pain breathing for seven breaths, the same number as the tapes and the supposed holiest number. To quote Kitco.com, seven is the number of completeness and perfection, both physical and spiritual. The number seven is important in Christianity, Hinduism, Islam, and Judaism." End quote. After these seven breaths, all Chico can say is, yeah. He's trying to act tough. He's been brainwashed into thinking he ought not to trust her. But this subconsciously echoes yet again, tape two, this time 229. And the sun is still up. See? Yeah. I missed you, Chico. Each of the breaths alternates between inhale and exhale. The eighth breath, or fourth exhale, is Chico's response. This enters the two into a kind of intercourse, a verbal kind. But now the two will soon engage in a sexual kind. At about 9.45, Chico says, enough already. This is a sort of torture for him. Then at around 9.50, we hear something very specific, a croaking frog. No. Sorry. Uh, enough already. You want to do it here? Some animal species use particular vocalization patterns to attract the female and reproduce. Songbirds, certain insects, 
and also the vocal cord parasites. The difference is that the parasites themselves did not produce sounds. Rather, they had their hosts, man, do it for them. Once secure on the human host vocal cords, a male vocal cord parasite caused the host to produce a certain sound pattern. Something like a warble of a bird. <laughs> Meanwhile, females parasitizing other host pharynxes need only wait upon hearing the sound pattern of an attractive mate. They would manipulate their hosts into making contact with the person it came from. The female traveled through his host's saliva to the other host's vocal cords where the male was waiting and the pair copulated. We can only imagine how the female manipulated his host, but it was probably through smell. I missed you, Chico. <sighs> yeah. Smells travel directly to the limbic system via the olfactory cilia in the nasal cavity. Volatile compounds released by the female would stimulate the limbic system, which controls instincts, making the host feel amorous. No. Sorry. Enough already. You want to do it here? Of course, again, we don't need parasites necessarily to explain what happens. Order. I hope you do not mind. I know it hurts right now, but it will all be over soon. Just thinking that helps keep the pain away. Chico, I would do anything to get you out of here. It is funny. I have never helped anyone else before. Only Cypher. That is the truth. I... I never imagined you would come for me. I... was not very nice at first, I know. But I did not mean it. I... I was afraid they would try to use you somehow. But to be honest, having you with me here put my mind at ease. I hope that does not sound selfish. I thought I would never make it. But together, I think we can. I'm watching you sleep as I record this. You have made me believe. That I will make it out of here. And that no matter what happens, it will not be the end for me. Thank you, Chico.
Now, tape 5 opens in the middle of more torture. It sounds as though a member of XOF is whipping Paws, except this time it's Chico who's commanding her to talk, just like Skullface did earlier of Chico. Nine seconds in, Chico chokes back tears. He thinks this is for her own good, like a, a parent who's spanking a wayward child. After a few seconds, Paws gives Chico what he wants vindictively. Coward! How can you say that? Traitor! She attacks with words, his manhood, his honor. Coward, traitor. It's not entirely clear who she means that Chico's betrayed. Now he tries to defeat her with overwhelming force. Don't make me mad! You're only making things worse! The implication is that both Paws has control and that Chico does too. He's saying, you can stop this or I can make this worse. They're doing nothing but yell at each other and hurt each other. Then from 19 to 23 seconds, we hear a heavy boot approach. It's worse. And then at 23, this person seems to grab the recorder, muffling it for a moment, perhaps with their hand. At 29 seconds, there's a distinct click of one of the player's buttons. Then the sound quality decreases. You're only making things worse. Take him back to his cage. What did I do? It seems like two different recorders were both rolling, and XOF have stitched together the footage for a forged, unbroken continuity. At 26 seconds, Skullface is close enough to the recorder, his breath distorts it somewhat. <laughs> Skullface then says to XOF, take him back to his cage, and in a demonstration of how brainwashed Chico's become, he responds in a panic, what did I do? This in turn gets answered with a slap around 32 seconds in. Like conditioning a dog, Chico is being taught that a slap means to shut up. Now curiously, Skullface repeats his command, but in Hungarian. If there's a language-based parasite around now, maybe Skullface has intentionally staffed the boiler room with some non-English speakers, who knows? It may also be a form of operational security to prevent unauthorized leaks. Whatever the case, now we hear the lurch of the cell door, and as Chico's being dragged away, he foreshadows Kaz's own remarks at the end of Ground Zeroes. Give it back! Give it back! Give it back! This isn't right, that was ours! Give it back. He fades from audiability, leaving Skullface and Paws alone in a sort of reset to the conditions before Chico's involvement. She's no good to us, dead. She looks weak. We need her alive. Yes, sir. She's whipped twice, but by a soldier who definitely speaks English. So next, we jump back to the old prison. Notice that ever since the kiss, and maybe more, Chico and Paws are being separated in more ways than one. Skullface has come to speak with Chico alone here for the first time since his priest-like confession near the end of tape four. Notice that Chico's love or feelings for Paws have been completely rewired and redirected onto the cassette player. Like a polite good boy, Chico's first and only concern is, can he have it back? Skullface lets the boy sit in silence for a few seconds before dropping the bombshell that, we've decided to let her go. But in between the asking and answering, we can make out the hoot of an owl. Can I have it back? It back? We've decided to let her go. Owls, frogs, and birds all make noise for the exact same reason, as a warning to males and a way of seducing females. But one thing only owls do is hoot to announce they've located an owlet, a kid, a chico, on the ground. They tend to hoot close to either sunset or sunrise, so it's likely that this is on the morning of March 14th. After Skullface's supposed revelation, at 123, there's the ominous rumble of an approaching storm.
Four seconds of processing leads Chico to conclude aloud that if they are letting her go, then it means she talked and that now they both will go free. But when he says she talked, it's through gritted teeth. It hurts Chico because he wasn't the one to break her. So, she talked. And he blames her. To recover some of his damaged ego, his manhood, he says resentfully, Told her she should have just gotten it over with. Told her to get it over with. Told her it was for her own good, in other words. But for a second time, next, Skullface shatters Chico's illusions. Told her she should have just gotten it over with. She's going back to your boss. He says, notably leaving the sentence singular, she, not you two, but she, is going back to your boss. Now, this phrase subconsciously echoes the way English speakers say that a broken up couple are getting back together. Going back to him. But the use of your boss also implies that Paz is sort of replacing Chico, going where she doesn't belong, the way that some parasites will replace an egg in a nest. To drive his point home, next Skullface says, She's going back to your boss. But only her. Huh? But only her. And now, like he did during the beginning of the sexual torture in tape four, Chico can't stifle his, huh? Skullface has heaped guilt and shame for nearly 20 long minutes now. But look how artfully he gets out of any responsibility and seems to Chico to be, as always, good to his word, a follower of laws. But only her. Huh? Those were the terms. Those were the terms, he says. This echoes the phrase terms of surrender, as well, of course, of terms of speech. Next, Skullface says, She said to leave you here. <sighs> I suppose she doesn't much care for you anymore. The way he says this implies that Paz has done to Chico what stereotypical straight men did to women back in the 70s. What they called back then, hit it and quit it. <clears throat> if not us, who else is going to rescue that bitch? You spy bitch! I suppose she doesn't much care for you anymore. That bitch! It shows how completely Chico believes in whatever Skullface says is the truth and internalized the misogyny in the form of language, of words, which kill his love for her, making him distrust her. For the second time, like back in the start of tape four, Skullface starts narrating Chico's thoughts for him. Now, you've got quite a problem on your hands. When she gets back, what will she say? thinking for him, like a puppet master with a puppet. After Skullface says, now you've got quite a problem on your hands, he seems to repeat the padding gesture that we've heard several times throughout these tapes. Bitch! Now, you've got quite a problem on your hands. When she gets back, what will she say? What follows is pure psychological terrorism. Skullface goes through a bevy of possible scenarios, each interlinked yet slightly worse than the last. He goes, what will she say? That you talked, sold out your comrades? This line echoes one of Skullface's from tape four. We were comrades once. The next one is the real death blow, your family. It actually brings tears to Chico's eyes. Your family? <laughs> You're finished. You mean I, I can't go home? There's very little I can do for you. Skullface spells it out for Chico. You're finished. Of course, none of what he's saying will or ever would take place, but the thought, the possibility, is all it takes. Just as Orwell tells Winston, the thought is all that counts. He's got Chico right where he wants him. Chico responds by signaling that he now considers Skullface a trustworthy asset, a teacher. But notice what he misses. Skullface never actually confirmed whether or not Paz talked in exchange for her freedom. He's just talking about a deal, a hypothetical deal that was made. So a different meaning that's loaded into his words is this. Maybe only Chico betrayed MSF. Maybe doing so is why Paz doesn't much care for him anymore, assuming this is even true. You see, Chico, like Winston, has been convinced of his own guilt over something he'll never actually know whether he did or didn't do. At one point when Winston demands to know from O'Brien whether the Brotherhood, the secret rebellion against the party, is even real, this is what O'Brien tells him. Does the Brotherhood exist? That, Winston, you will never know. 
If we choose to set you free when we have finished with you, and if you live to be ninety years old, still you will never learn whether the answer to that question is yes or no. This also leaves Skullface's true loyalties in Chico's mind a mystery. The way he says, you're finished, it's like an angry father dressing down a delinquent. This is, after all, a detention center. Chico's question, you mean I can't go home? It's like a defendant pleading with his defense attorney and his judge at the same time. Skullface evades this by referring to simply we, as if he were not the one calling all the shots. And maybe he isn't, who knows? Elements of this could be part of Cypher, the organization, and or Zeros, as in the individuals, revenge on Snake for rejecting them now a second time. Skullface claims in effect that his hands are tied. There's very little I can do for you, he says. But notice what's being said here and what follows. Is Skullface talking about letting Chico escape instead of pause? Or is he talking about simply granting Chico a quick death? A death penalty instead of a wretched remaining life stuck being tortured behind bars. Skullface says there's very little I can do for you and I still have need of your services. There's a lot to unpack about this sentence. The way he says it, it's almost like, ah, oh, such a shame. There was still a chance for you to do some good in this world, some law-abiding goodness before you die. It also conveys the idea in a very underhanded way that Chico brought all this on himself. His services can mean at least two different things. One, his cooperation to the detriment of MSF. Two, his participation helping the just exact punishment on the unjust, Skullface on Paws and MSF. It's guilt and praise wrapped into one Whatever Skullface means to imply, yet again, all Chico can reply with is, huh? It's a destabilizing shift going from tr treating Chico like a sinner to one of the apostles, a rule breaker to a rule enforcer, an enemy to a friend. It sends the poor kid's head spinning. So Skullface helps him see things the right way, grabbing him. Skullface not asks, but commands the in a sort of theoretical, almost friendly tone, you're going to help call your boss for help. Then he says, wheel, and this time Chico's included in the we, that we'll make a recording, play it across public frequency bands. And this brings up an important uh, point about a similar organization to the IAEA, the International Telecom Union, or ITU. It's the oldest global international organization and an outfit attached to the UN. See, the only way for the world to use the radio spectrum is by sharing it. Only certain frequencies are allowed use by the public as opposed to the military. And which frequencies are being used at any one time has to be decided over by this international body. You can hear that Skullface must be holding a tape out to Chico at around 240, showing him the way, dangling it right in front of him the way that he once did pause back in tape two. Chico is still confused. He confirms to bring him here. Then after some thunder, he concludes this is a trick it's too good to be true. What has he done to deserve it? So he dismisses it. Yeah, right. And I still have need of your services. Huh? You're going to call your boss for help. We'll make a recording played across public frequency bands. To bring him here? Yeah, right. Then he says more angrily and aggressively than he's ever been, you expect me to trust you? What's left unsaid is, after what you've done to me, after what you've made me do, to become. And then, I'll never help you. What's left unsaid is, again, I'll never help you again. Then Skullface responds with an even keel. He says, perhaps, but if you did, I wouldn't mind looking the other way if he did come for you. He's offering to bend the rules a little, just this once. It makes the entire scheme sound like it's purely for Chico's benefit. That doing it wouldn't be helping Skullface, only Chico. That it is, in other words, a gift, a way out for him to take himself. What happened to, if you're a real soldier, you'll find your own way out? Well, Skullface has made it seem that's exactly what he's providing, a way out. All Chico has to do is find it, in other words, realize it and seize the opportunity. It's changed the original statement's meaning, own way out, as in, sans pause. Just as he did a moment ago, but in a, in a completely reversed framing, Skullface does Chico's thinking for him, filling his mind with scenarios. He says, leaving out the pronoun I, take some guards off duty, let you quietly slip away. Skullface 
could be saying in essence that it won't be Snake he'll maybe look the other way for and let escape, but Chico. In other words, that Snake and Chico would trade places. Again, he could also be simply saying he'll let Snake take Chico and Paz's place, or that he'll let Snake come for Chico and take him to his death as punishment for all Chico supposedly done of his own debased free will. This brings us to the next bombshell. Skullface has terms of his own. Fair is fair, right? Equality and the rule of law, right? He says, but you wouldn't want the girl leaving here alive. This is the third time that he refuses to call Paz by name, only by her gender. There is long enough of a pause after this for a helicopter to pass overhead. Do you expect me to trust you? I'll never help you! Perhaps, but if you did, I wouldn't mind looking the other way if he did come for you. Take some guards off duty, let you quietly slip away. But, you wouldn't want the girl leaving here alive. She'd have to be eliminated before he came. There's no other way. I'll leave you to think it over. The closer we get to the end of Chico's tapes, the more fragmented the narrative grows. If the tape is a sort of metaphor for an objective record of the truth, we find through this fragmentation an expression of the idea that this truth itself has been distorted, altered simply by the retelling or replaying. To say nothing of all the alterations that have clearly been made by someone, presumably Skullface and XOF. The tapes end with somewhat of a betrayal of the player ourselves and of the premise that we can trust the dates provided by them in each title. After all, the final recording is by pause, which couldn't have possibly taken place on the 15th. Most likely it was recorded in the early morning of March 13th, after she and Chico presumably had sex. A huge chunk of tape 6 is missing, which we won't actually unlock until after we beat the Phantom Pain. And the way that Chico comes to obsess over the tape recorder in place of pause is a little detail that we'll only ascertain by cross-referencing multiple points across multiple tapes, along with the opening scene of Ground Zeroes. Here's one theory that I'm pretty confident in sharing. So at this stage in the overarching series storyline, 1975, the Patriot AIs are basically coming of age, not unlike Chico. They were created, you'll remember, in the wake of Peace Walker, so right around the same time as these tapes. To bend Chico to his will, Skullface essentially recreates one of the boy's worst nightmares. Back during Peace Walker, Chico was tortured as a form of interrogation by the CIA. He gave up his own family, and he's lived with that horrible guilt ever since. By recreating an even worse version of Chico's bad memories, Skullface here has demonstrated the power of simulation, of information control. By mimicking patterns and following codes, the Patriots in MGS2 will unveil their so-called system for societal sanity. The way that Skullface treats Chico, a child soldier trapped fighting a cipher proxy war, the Patriots will eventually treat Raiden. There's even a subtle echo of a line from MGS2. Either you take her now, or you're strung up next. I think I was only six when I held my first AK, but I'm not even sure of that. Jack. I'm not like Snake. I never questioned why we fought. There was no purpose, no way out. They give you a gun, you ask how many to kill. If you didn't, you were the one they shot instead. The way that Skullface corrupts Chico and acculturates him into an atmosphere of utter brutality will seemingly directly affect the AIs known as the Patriots. They, like us, will have these tapes to study these records left behind after the deaths of Chico, Paz, and Skullface, these memes to learn from. It is Skullface's ultimate goal of corrupting the system, of implanting it with the thirst for revenge, as his own legacy or meme to leave as his mark upon the world. The Patriots will try to implant their will with nanomachines and control over context, yet ironically this is all apparently just an imitation of the methods used by Skullface throughout these tapes, which allowed him such incredible powers of manipulation that we may as well call it mind control. A kinder, gentler, more invisible version of them, but an imitation nonetheless. This brings up a key reference that the Ground Zero tapes are making to the Jonestown incident in the late 70s. 
If Ground Zeroes has seemed to satirize the orthodox thinking and ritualism of all forms of monotheism, the connections to Jonestown expand this critique to even secular cults. The local belief system in Japan is called Shinto, and unlike most of the world religions and systems, it isn't written down. There's no record outside the living minds of those who practice it. That seems relevant here. It's also worth noting that the infamous mass deaths at Jonestown, which have never been conclusively determined whether they were suicides or mass murders, despite leaving in their wake over a thousand cassette recordings that were made throughout the cult's existence, this event was the largest number of American civilians killed deliberately in history prior to 9-11. The group, by the way, who either perpetrated this mass murder or was victimized by it, were called the People's Temple, aka, wait for it, PT. More connections to Jonestown can be drawn simply by the proxy of the famous or infamous, depending on your interpretation, psychologist Philip G. Zimbardo. Ironically, Zimbardo is mostly known for the Stanford Prison Experiment. Zimbardo is widely believed to have proven in that experiment that the penal system in America can never be truly reformed because it supposedly forces people to play roles like guard or prisoner, and that these roles inherently redefine everyone involved's sense of self for as long as they're behind bars. Which is why nothing can be done to ameliorate this tragic but unavoidable problem. It turns out Zimbardo is a great big phony. The subjects of the experiment were trained to produce the results he wanted, and as numerous professional organizations and peer-reviewed academic journals have proven since, the entire debacle was little more than a hoax. Yet Zimbardo claims today, ironically, that the fact his little ruse resonated so strongly with the public's preconceptions, and so clearly absolved us all of our complicity and mutual guilt in allowing the existence of the prison industrial complex, this alone proves he isn't a fraud. Anyway, Zimbardo, relative to the mass deaths at Jonestown, claims that Jim Jones, the cult's big boss-like leader, developed mind control techniques that involves recording and playing over and over again tapes, and that he innovated these techniques simply by reading George Orwell's 1984. How much we can rely on Zimbardo for a truthful analysis is something I'll leave up to you to decide. But I'll end now with this. Supposedly, according to Zimbardo, one way that PT was inspired by 1984 was creating their own Ministry of Truth, called DD, Department of Diversion. Quote, its purpose was to carry out sensitive work in their new nation's government involving gathering data on selected politicians that could be used to persuade them to cooperate with the goals and needs of PT, end quote. We of course can compare this DD to Diamond Dogs and specifically their organization Hewick, which networked and created a similar sort of international system of blackmail in the Phantom Pain. Chico, growing up means choosing how you're going to live your life. Who's there? Chico, it's me. Joy. Joy, that photographer. That's right. A war photographer. Huh? I thought you were here for the birds. Yeah, um, the birds of the battle. Whoa! Is that just... Can I see it? Wow, the same kind of Che used! You can't keep it, kid. Here, have these instead. Those photos! Huh. Oh no, Amanda! She's safe. Don't worry. Are you sure? We're patching her up back in my place. She's hurt? I said, don't worry. It's just a broken leg. You got any cigarettes? Mm. Hey, cigar, huh? Hey! It's not for kids. Chico, do you know where they took the cargo? Cargo? What cargo? Let me rephrase that. How do they get stuff from the coast up here? Oh, that I can tell you. When the cargo gets to the harbor, they first send it up the marshes on a barge. Then, they load it onto a jungle train past the banana plantation and transport it by rail. The train stops here. When it gets to the train terminal past the coffee plantation, they reload it again. 
this time onto a truck, which disappears into a tunnel heading toward the mountains. Disappears? Chico, what's on the other side of that tunnel? Nobody knows. None of our compas ever got close enough. He's protected by a spirit. A uh, spirit? Yeah, a giant monster. El Basilisco. The King of Snakes. No, 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 really, I saw it. I was camping up there one day, and just as I was waking up around dawn, I heard this loud noise. I opened my eyes and saw an enormous shadow. It must have been 30 bara at least. He was walking on legs as big as trees. Where did you see it? At the terminal near the tunnel. But I only saw it that one time. What exactly were you doing there? I, uh... Well, me and my sister got into a fight. And you just happened to go camping. You know, their train should be arriving at the place I saw El Basilisco right about now. Is it far? No, really. Go past the coffee plantation, and it'll be to the north. What are you chasing? Hmm. Something that could keep the world in balance. Or destroy it. Huh? I heard that place was a narcotics plant before those guys took it over. But you already knew that, didn't you? Huh. Look, I get it. Even revolutionaries need to pay the bills. Still, must be tough for a kid like you to swallow. You're damn right it is. The route they use to transport stuff is the same one me viejo used to smuggle drugs. He sold the drugs to the Norte Americanos and used the profits to fund the army. They tried to keep it hidden from me. Is that why you went camping? Yes. I managed to sneak into the plant a few times and... I tried to set it on fire. Everyone treats me like a child. I, I, I couldn't stand it anymore. I'm not a kid, I'm 12. Couldn't do it though, could you? Chico, growing up means choosing how you're going to live your life. To do the right thing, you sometimes have to leave the things you care about behind. Parents, family, your homeland. But mi viejo... Papa... Chico, look at the photos. Mi viejo... He's gone. But there's one thing you don't ever leave behind. Your memories. Keep them safe. You want to get out of here, Chico? I do, but... Come back with me. Your sister's waiting for you. I can't go back. I can't face everybody. You told them where your compas are. I see. Nothing to be ashamed of. Pain gets the better of us all. <laughs> I wish I was dead. Okay then, I'll put you out of your misery. What? Any last words? Oh. Shoot, you are only going to kill a man. I just wasted a bullet. Don't waste your life. Listen to me, Chico. You died here today, you understand? You're Ombre Nuevo, a new man. Now, give that new life to me. Huh? Fight with me, little soldier. Show me how strong you really are. <laughs> Dry your tears, then promise me one thing. No smoking until you get older. Remember, Real heroes are never as polished as the legends that surround them. You got it, boss. Uh, Snake is fine. What's that?
Thank mm-hmm. you.